Okay, tonight we're looking at the topic, Is Jesus My Brother? Many people have a high regard for Jesus as a teacher, but pull back at the thought that he was God incarnate. In certain circles, it is popular to claim that Jesus never said he was God, that it was a later teaching read back into the story. However, the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament carry the same message as it does today. The first chapter of Matthew tells us that after Mary was found with child, the angel told Joseph that the pregnancy was of God and that he was to name the child Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This would be in fulfillment of the promise in Isaiah 7, 14, that the Messiah would be Emmanuel or God with us. In John chapter 10, we read that one day in Jerusalem, as Jesus was walking in the temple courtyard, certain Jewish men demanded that he tell them plainly if he was the promised Messiah. He responded, I told you and you believed not. Then after comments about his sheep hearing his voice, Jesus plainly said, I and my father are one. This so angered the men that they took up stones to stone him. Jesus then asked them for which good work they were prepared to do this. They responded, we are not stoning you for any of these, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. The men recognized that for Jesus to declare, I and my Father are one, was to claim that he was deity. John 8, 58 is another example. Jesus declares, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. Again, the Jews' response was to take up stones in an attempt to stone him. Jesus announcing his identity as I am is a direct application of the Old Testament name of God in Exodus 3, 13 through 15. When God called Moses to go to his people, Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? And God responded, tell them, I am sent you. Why would the Jews want to stone Jesus if he had not said something they had believed to be blasphemous, namely a claim to being God? Clearly the New Testament puts forward the claim that Jesus is one with the Father. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I might mention here that uh, we have a manuscript uh, part of John 1, 1, that dates to about um, 180 AD. And so that particular verse is one that's pretty well nailed down as coming to us about as uh, direct as you can get. There's obviously been no change in that, even though Joseph Smith made changes in his inspired revision. Uh, the earliest manuscript of John 1.1 1, 1 uh, still reads the same. A few verses later, John writes, the word became flesh. Here we see John is presenting Jesus as both our creator and God. When Thomas saw the risen Christ, he declared, my Lord and my God. And for him to say that is acknowledging, uh, for Jesus to accept that would be to be accepting worship. And if Jesus had not been God, he would never have allowed Thomas to do that, to address him that way. In a similar manner, Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I don't know how many times all gets used in that section, uh, but I think we get the point. Uh, when he says all, he kind of means all. All things were created by him. If the Son is before all things, and all things were created by him, then he is truly God, and not a spirit being who had to advance to godhood. The author of Hebrews declares, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then he has always been God, and he had no beginning. 
The Apostle Peter says the same, referring to the Son, as our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But when we turn to LDS literature, we find that the deity of Christ has been greatly modified. According to Mormonism, Jesus has not always been God, but is one of millions, maybe billions, of spirit brothers, each of whom could potentially have been chosen as the Savior. Last week, we looked at the LDS teaching on the nature of God. Joseph Smith taught that God was once immortal on another world, and after his death and resurrection, he advanced to become the Heavenly Father for our world. In the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, we read, just as God organized pre-existing matter to create the universe, so he organized pre-existing intelligence to create the spirits that eventually became human beings. This would mean that not only you and I were first pre-existing intelligence before our birth as spirit children of Heavenly Father and Mother, but that Jesus was the same. This would rob Jesus of his uniqueness as God. Then it could not be said of him that he was from everlasting to everlasting, and Thomas was wrong to proclaim that the risen Christ was his Lord and God. Mormons not only teach that Jesus is our elder spirit brother, but that Lucifer is as well. Let's look at a few statements by LDS leaders. <laughs> now we'll see how smart I am. Yay, yay team. <laughs> I couldn't do it last week. <laughs> One button is a little hard. <laughs> okay. LDS church leader Jess Christensen wrote in the Ensign magazine, which is the official magazine for the Mormons, <clears throat> On first hearing the doctrine that Lucifer and our Lord Jesus Christ are brothers may seem surprising to some, especially to those unacquainted with Latter-day Revelations. But both the scriptures and the prophets affirm that Jesus Christ and Lucifer are indeed offspring of our Heavenly Father and therefore spirit brothers. But as the firstborn of the Father, Jesus was Lucifer's older brother. From this we see that prior to Lucifer's rebellion, he and Jesus were on equal footing. Whatever could have been said about Jesus and his nature at that time could have been said of Lucifer and all of us. Mormons believe that in the distant past, all of Heavenly Father's millions of spirit children were called to a grand council where the two oldest sons, Jesus and Lucifer, presented their plan for life on earth. LDS Apostle John A. Witzel wrote, in the Grand Council called to ratify the Father's plan, a great difference arose. The majority led by the firstborn of the Father, our elder brother, Jesus the Christ, was ready to accept the plan with all its conditions. The minority led by Lucifer, a son of the morning, feared the isolation and the pains and ills of earth. For them, Lucifer proposed that they should be sent to earth, but returned with earthly bodies irrespective of their works on earth. This latter plan seemed, seemed desirable that one third of those present favored it. In direct opposition of God's plan, Lucifer and his followers were thrown out of the council and as opponents of God's plan became the devil and his angels who strive ever to tempt men to disobey the laws of God. That's the end of the quote by Witzel. Thus, according to Mormonism, Jesus stood for free agency with the possibility that some would not return to Heavenly Father. But Lucifer wanted all to be saved with no free agency. This resulted in a great war, at which time God expelled from heaven Lucifer and one-third of his spirit children, who would then become the devil and his agents on earth. So we want to look at a statement by Joseph Smith. <clears throat> the contention, this is Joseph Smith. The contention in heaven was, 
Jesus said that there would be certain souls that would not be saved. And the devil said he could save them all and laid his plans before the grand council who gave their vote in favor of Jesus Christ. So the devil rose up in rebellion against God and was cast out with all who put up their heads for him. End of quote. Here we see Joseph Smith teaching something totally outside the Bible. God did not need a planning committee with all of his millions of spirit children to vote on how to govern people on his future earth. God spoke and it was done. Isaiah wrote, this is what the Lord says, your redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. But who is the God who spoke in the Old Testament? To Christians, it is the Lord God who spoke to Moses, the great I am, also referred to as Jehovah. To Mormons, Jehovah is the son of God, totally separate from Heavenly Father. They teach that God the Father is named Elohim, while Jesus is named Jehovah. LDS President Joseph F. Smith stated, among the spirit children of Elohim, the firstborn was and is Jehovah, or Jesus Christ, to whom all others are juniors. Notice when he says juniors, uh, it takes away from Jesus being God eternally, because we're all on the same footing. But the Bible does not separate Elohim into a different God from Jehovah. When we read in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, it is using both words, Elohim and Jehovah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, and when you see Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, it stands for Jehovah. Our God, meaning Elohim, is one Lord, meaning Jehovah. So it's Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our Elohim is one Jehovah. Mormons want to take this, uh, these names and break them down into two separate people, and you just can't do that. If you're reading the Old Testament and see the Hebrew words behind Lord and God, you realize how they're all interchanged. It's one being, one God being referenced, whether it's Lord or Je uh, Jehovah or Elohim. However, in the LDS temple ceremony, the creation drama has Elohim the Father and Jehovah the Son as two separate individual gods. If Jesus is Jehovah of the Old Testament, then he is the one who said to Isaiah, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me, which wouldn't fit the Mormon understanding of God. According to Mormonism, after Lucifer was cast out of heaven, God's plan could proceed. Each spirit would now be sent to earth to work toward his own godhood, just as Heavenly Father had done. In the Encyclopedia of Mormonism we read, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaches that all resurrected and perfected mortals become gods. They will dwell again with the Father, God the Father and live and act like him and endless worlds of happiness, power, love, glory, and knowledge. Above all, they will have the power of procreating endless lives. Latter-day Saints believe that Jesus Christ attained godhood and that he marked the path and led the way for others likewise to become exalted divine beings by following him. But the Bible teaches no such doctrine. Isaiah proclaimed, with whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah 46 verses 5 and 9. LDS President Gordon B. Hinckley admitted that the LDS view of Jesus is completely different from standard Christianity. In 1998, the Deseret News reported, in bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, President Hinckley spoke of those outside the church who say Latter-day Saints do not believe in the traditional Christ. No, I don't. The traditional Jesus of whom they speak is not the Christ of whom I speak. 
For the Jesus of whom I speak has been revealed in this dispensation of the fullness of times. That was Gordon B. Hinckley in 1998. There is nothing in the Bible to indicate that Lucifer and Jesus are brothers or that we are the same species as them. When Jesus said, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world, in John 8, 23, he was declaring his eternal godhood. He is from heaven, we are mortals on earth. He is the creator and we are the creation. Paul explains in Colossians 1, 15 through 17 that Christ is the creator. As such, he stands at the head of creation. Quote, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Many times when I talk about these things with a Mormon, they always want to make the all apply to all things from the time of creation forward. But that isn't the meaning when you go through the Bible verses. It means all things, all time, all creation. There's there's one God who has always existed. (laughs) It it isn't a matter of saying, well, uh, there's only one God starting from creation. The Bible's declaring there's one God eternally. Uh, outside of time, outside of creation. Thus we see the distinction between Jesus and humans. He has always existed as God. We had a beginning as his creation. Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 8 that even though there are beings who have been designated gods, there is only one true God. Quote, So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols... We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as indeed there are many gods and lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Now I know Mormons like to take this verse Uh, about gods and lords many, but the context is clearly about pagan deities. has nothing to do with uh, anyone that's truly deity. This is reinforced in the book of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. John 1, 1 through 4. Also, Mormonism maintains that angels are our spirit brothers, just in another stage of advancement. Yet the Bible presents them as God's creation, not his literal children. The psalmist declares, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. Psalms 148, verses 2 through 5. Nehemiah wrote, You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Speaking at the October 1969 LDS conference, Apostle Sterling W. Sill explained how men, angels, and gods are the same species. Quote, it is helpful for us to remember that God, angels, spirits, men are all the same species in different stages of development and in various degrees of righteousness. I find that one a little curious. Various degrees of righteousness. Uh, God, angel, spirits, men. Well, I guess men are at varying degrees of righteousness, but you see how the whole concept here is diminishing the holiness, the uniqueness of Jesus, of God, bringing them down to human level. Mormons will say to me, no, we're not bringing God down, we're elevating man. Well, by elevating man, you are bringing God down. 
because we are sinful, we are not consistent, we are not holy, <laughs> we're not all-knowing, and God is. Again, we see how the LDS idea that God, men, and angels all have the same origin as intelligences with the same ability to progress to godhood robs both the Father and Son of their singularity and eternal existence as God. Now we get to another curious aspect of Mormonism. Is Jesus married? Joseph Smith maintained that Jesus followed his father's footsteps in becoming a savior. Quote, the son doeth what he hath seen the father do, then the father hath some day laid down his life and taken it again. And that's from Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, uh, pages 311 and 312. So here Joseph Smith's trying to say that uh, Jesus does just what he saw the Father. Therefore, if uh, the Father, if Jesus was uh, going to be an, do an atonement, his Father also did an atonement because he's following what he fought, saw his Father do. But by this reasoning, it would follow that Jesus was also married, since Mormonism clearly teaches that Heavenly Father has at least one wife. Also, Mormonism insists that for mortals to advance to godhood, they must be sealed in an LDS temple marriage. In the 2000 LDS Manual, Duties and Blessings of the Priesthood, Basic Manual for Priesthood Holders, it states, Eternal marriage is a basic doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ and a very important part of the Lord's plan for us. Without it, we cannot be exalted in the celestial kingdom in eternity. It follows then that if Heavenly Father was married while immortal, Jesus would have done the same. While the LDS Church is currently reluctant to discuss Jesus' possible marriage, it was a popular teaching during pioneer times. In 1854, LDS Apostle Orson Hyde, preaching at General Conference, announced, Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage of Cana and Galilee. Later in his sermon, he stated, I shall say here that before the Savior died, he looked upon his own natural children as we look upon ours. He, speaking of Jesus, saw his seed and immediately afterwards he was cut off from the earth. LDS Apostle Orson Pratt, writing in 1853, said, Next, let us inquire whether there are any intimations in Scripture concerning the wives of Jesus. We have already spoken of the endless increase of Christ's government. Now we have no reason to suppose that this increase would continue unless through the laws of generation, whereby Jesus, like his father, should become the father of spirits, and in order to become the father of spirits, or as Isaiah says, the everlasting father, it is necessary that he should have one or more wives by whom he could multiply his seed, not for any limited period of time, but forever and ever. If all the acts of Jesus were written, we no doubt should learn that these beloved women, and he had earlier named them, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene, that these beloved women were his wives. And that's from the Seer, page 159. And I know some Mormons will dismiss statements by Pratt or Hyde, but remember these were apostles, and the Mormons want to claim that they have priesthood authority and the same setup in their church as the original church. Therefore, anyone ordained and set apart as an apostle that is officially teaching for the church should be someone that we could go to for instruction. Otherwise, what's the point in having them? I could just ask the person next door. The idea of having an apostle is so that you have some sort of surety to doctrine. That Jesus was married and had children was widely accepted at that time. Not only that, many leaders also believed that Jesus' descendants were among the top LDS leadership. LDS apostle Rudger Clausen recorded in his diary for July 2, 1899, 
the remarks made at a solemn assembly attended by 700 men. This is a quoting from his diary, and they're meeting at the Salt Lake Temple. President Snow read Section 89, uh, 86, Book of Doctrine and Covenants, said we are the sons and daughters of God and descendants of the prophets and apostles. Skipping down. At about five o'clock, the meeting was resumed in the celestial and terrestrial rooms of the temple. President George Q. Cannon spoke. Among other things, he said, there are those in this audience, that's the 700 Mormon men sitting in this temple solemn assembly, there are those in this audience who are descendants of the old 12 apostles, referring back to Jesus, 12 apostles, and shall I say it? Yes, descendants of the Savior himself. His seed is represented in this body of men. In 1963, a man wrote to Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th president of the LDS Church, and asked if Jesus was married. Smith's answer was, yes, but do not preach it. The Lord advised us not to cast pearls before swine. And I have a copy of that letter, and I know the man who wrote to Joseph Fielding Smith. But it was a private letter. <laughs> <clears throat> However, the Bible never mentions that Jesus had a wife or children. In fact, his statement that the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head in Matthew 8.20 would seem to indicate that he was not maintaining a family. Also at the cross, Jesus asked John to take care of his mother, but said nothing about taking care of a whole family. You can see that in John chapter 19. If in fact Jesus was leaving a widow with children, Surely he would have asked someone to take care of them as well. As a curious side note, if Jesus did what he saw the Father do, namely take on human flesh, why hasn't the Holy Ghost done the same? Also, if all of God's spirit children needed a resurrected body and an eternal marriage, why didn't the Holy Ghost need that as well? Mormons concede that the Holy Ghost does not have a body, yet they say he is part of the God, Godhead. While Mormons maintain that our eternal progression would have been thwarted without obtaining a body, somehow the Holy Ghost got a different path to Godhood. In relation to Christ's atonement, Mormons teach that it was an infinite atonement covering everyone on all worlds under Heavenly Father's rule. In the 2010 booklet, Doctrines of the Gospel Student Manual, <clears throat> page 25, we read, Now our Lord's jurisdiction and power extended far beyond the limits of this one small earth on which we dwell. He is under the Father, the creator of worlds without number. And through the power of his atonement, the inhabitants of these worlds, the revelations say, are begotten sons and daughters of God, and that's from the Doctrine and Covenants, which means that the atonement of Christ, being literally and truly infinite, applies to an infinite number of earths. However, this raises the question of who was covered by Heavenly Father's atonement. Remember, Joseph Smith said that Jesus followed his Father's footsteps in being a Savior of the world. Then the quote was, the son doeth what he hath seen the father do, then the father has someday laid down his life and taken it again. So the question is, who did Heavenly Father die for? And if man is going to progress to godhood and have children that never end, will someone in his world have to atone for his children? To add to the confusion, Brigham Young declared, sin is upon every earth that was ever created. Consequently, every earth has its redeemer and every earth has its tempter. And the people thereof in their turn and time receive all that we receive and pass through all the ordeals that we are passing through. And that's Journal of Discourses, 
volume 14, pages 71 and 72. Further diminishing the role of Christ, we read in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, Latter-day Saints believe that Jesus Christ attained godhood and that he marked the path and led the way for others likewise to become exalted divine beings by following him. Thus, every faithful Mormon is promised that he too can achieve godhood the same as Jesus. But this is not the Jesus we discover in the Bible. Mormonism also diminishes the importance of the cross. The LDS Church claims that Jesus atoned for our sins mainly in Gethsemane. Partly due to the overemphasis of Gethsemane, Mormons do not place crosses on their buildings or wear crosses. Speaking at the April 2004 LDS conference, Apostle M. Russell Ballard stated, there in the quiet isolation of the Garden of Gethsemane, he knelt among the gnarled olive trees and in some incredible way that none of us can fully comprehend, the Savior took upon himself the sins of the world. Even though his life was pure and free of sin, he paid the ultimate penalty for sin, yours and mine, and everyone who has ever lived. His mental, emotional, and spiritual anguish were so great that they caused him to bleed from every pore. However, the Bible does not say that Jesus actually sweat blood, only that his suffering was so intense that it was like, it was as if he was sweating uh, drops of blood. But notice the emphasis on the atonement being in Gethsemane. <laughs> LDS President Ezra Tapp Benson gave this description of the atonement. It was in Gethsemane that Jesus took on himself the sins of the world. In Gethsemane, that his pain was equivalent to the cumulative burden of all men. In Gethsemane, that he descended below all things so that, he could re so that all could repent and come to him. However, the New Testament links Jesus' suffering and death on the cross with the atonement, not his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul stressed that Christ's death was of primary importance in the atonement. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, he wrote, For what I received I pass on to you, that Christ died for our sins. Not that he suffered in Gethsemane, but that he died for our sins. Throughout the New Testament, it is the death of Christ that is stressed, not the suffering in Gethsemane. In Romans, Paul wrote, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Then in Galatians, Paul writes, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And that's Galatians 6, 14. We see the cross repeatedly mentioned in the New Testament. That's where the emphasis is. That's where Christ hung, and when he said, it is finished, it was from his suffering on the cross, his death. In closing, let me review a few passages. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that the word was God. John 1.14 says the word became flesh. Thomas declared to Jesus, my Lord and my God. The Apostle Paul describes him as our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter says the same, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah prophesied, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Why is the question over Jesus' true identity important? Why does it matter whether or not Jesus is God? The most important reason that Jesus has to be God is that if he is not God, his dead would not, death would not have been sufficient to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. Only God could make such an infinite atonement. Jesus had to be God so that he could pay our debt. Jesus had to be man so that he could die. Salvation is available only through faith in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus' deity is why he proclaimed, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. At this time, we're going to have a few minutes of question and answer, and I'll take the mic around. So if you have something you'd like to say, raise your hand. I would ask that you keep your questions focused and short. Um, there's probably some great stories in this room, but this isn't the time to share them. So uh, but if you have some questions for Sandra, uh, raise your hand. Let me know. I'll come by. Anyone? I got 10 questions. Oh. <laughs> we'll, we'll take one. Let's start with one. some of this doctrine, a lot of people won't, I don't react to it. However, um, how does, how do they reconcile with the contradictions within the doctrine from one apostle to the next to Bruce Arnold kind of, you know, how do they? Well, the way the Mormons do it is by simply saying uh, that we are, we are, how do they word that? Um, we follow the living prophet. And so I always put it to living prophet. And then I remind them, yes, but 100 years ago, those guys were the living prophets. So it must have been true 100 years ago. So I don't see how you can use that as a way of dismissing the problem. The problem is their leaders do contradict each other. They do say different things. And yet they want to say that the Christian church is so divided and Christianity has uh, such contradictions within it that you can't believe it. And so we needed the restoration of the true church, which supposedly gave us a prophet, that supposedly gave us the sure word of God. And yet we find over the, what, 100 and some odd years that Mormonism has been going, almost 200, uh, there is this continual revamping of the doctrine, reformulating. And today we see them toning it down Whereas when I was a Mormon back in the 50s, uh, they were very proud of a lot of the doctrines that they won't even talk about today, uh, such as man's ability to become a god, just like God did. So it's trying to be more accepted. But I don't see that the doctrine has really changed. It's just that they have finessed how they word it. And so they can say to the Christian, well, we, we believe in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Uh, we just see them as three uh, different gods, not three gods in one, uh, three uh, men in one or whatever. And they always get all that mixed up. But uh, it isn't just that. It isn't just saying whether or not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three separate or three in unity. It's that they aren't just three. <laughs> they got... They got mother gods out there that they don't want to even talk about. And supposedly every Mormon woman's goal is uh, to get married in, in the temple to a husband that where she and her husband will go off and start creating spirit babies for their worlds. And she becomes a silent partner then. So they don't want to talk about that part. But they don't talk about the fact that there were gods before the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not only that, by Mormon standards, our God would have brothers all through the universe who would have done the same thing. Because when he says he was once a human on an earth and died and uh, made an atonement, when the father made an atonement, that was for some other god who had billions of spirit babies that were sent to, to, to some other world. And our god was the savior for that world. But that means there were possibly millions of people on that world that had the potential to become gods. And so it just spreads out forever. It isn't just Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's that everybody's got mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, uncles, cousins. There are running worlds out there. So from the Christian perspective, this becomes a great blasphemy <laughs> uh, because it tears God down to man. But they just say, that was then, this is now, move on. Okay, great question. All right. 
Yes. And could you elaborate a little on that evolution and perhaps why it uh, became such a big issue for Kirkland to make this big transition from the Trinity to the Trinity or the first transition? Okay, I think it's uh, interesting when Joseph Smith writes his book of Mormon, and I think he is the author of it, uh, when you look at the title page, uh, where it says, wherefore, it's an abridgment of the record, and it's got these two little paragraphs on the front. And uh, it says, to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof, sealed by the hand of Moroni, and hid up by the Lord to come forth in due time by way of the Gentiles. And it goes on and on. You get down to the bottom, and it says, the whole point of this coming forth this book and also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentiles that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself to all nations. That's the title page. Then you turn back to the testimony of the witnesses, and it ends, uh, the three witnesses ends, and the honor be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, which is one God. When you read through the Book of Mormon, you will find that it teaches one God. Now, some parts of the Book of Mormon sound like standard Christian Trinitarian doctrine, but there are parts of it that are like modalism, where it's a confusion of Jesus with the Father. But it is firmly committed to one God. And when you look at the earliest revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, you will see they also point to just one God. I'm not sure what all influenced Joseph Smith uh, to move away from that, but we find that in his Protestant upbringing, he was dissatisfied with the churches, but he had basically a layman's understanding of basic Christianity that bleeds through into the Book of Mormon. But the further he moves away from that Protestant upbringing, or Catholic for that matter, but he, his was a Protestant upbringing, the further he moves away from that, the more speculative and wild his doctrines become. And I think as he finds out people believe him, it sets his mind free <laughs> to uh, just imagine uh, greater and bigger things. And so he starts this evolution, I assume he's trying to make sense of the Trinity. And so in the Book of Mormon, he's struggling and he gets it confused and, and Jesus and the Father are the same thing. Then he starts trying to separate this out and maybe because of Sidney Rigdon, who was a Campbellite preacher who joined Mormonism, he may have been an influence on this. Joseph starts to develop a difference between the Father and Son and so in Kirtland, in uh, the Doctrine and Covenants at that time, there was a section called the Lectures on Faith. And in the Lectures on Faith, I think it's number five, um, he uh, talks about the Father being a personage of spirit and the Son being a personage of tabernacle. So in 1835 Mormonism, there was not a teaching that the Father had a physical form. Now, Mormons will balk at that because they say, oh no, in 1820 he saw the Father and Son and then he knew that God had a body. Well, the problem is that's backdating uh, a story that he didn't tell at that time and the doctrine of God having a body developed much later in Mormonism. 1835 Mormonism, the Father was a spirit, the Son had tabernacle or a body. And he starts playing with this and so the... Uh, the separating out of the father and son uh, leads him, and then he studies um, Hebrew with this uh, Jewish man 
and finds out that Elohim is a plural word. And so that sets him off on this other tangent that, oh, if Elohim's a plural word, then there, there must be plural gods. <laughs> uh, but the Jews always knew it was a plural word, and it didn't make them <laughs> see that as talking about a council of gods. They always saw that as just one god. And uh, the use of Elohim was uh, used in majesty of the plurality of God, not in the sense of numbers of persons. But Joseph takes the plurality uh, of Elohim and from that jumps into a, a further uh, doctrine. Uh, he gets the book of Abraham, start, the papyri, and starts working on his book of Abraham, but, which has plural gods in the last half of it. But that last half wasn't written in Kirtland. It represents a development of his theology that comes uh, after that. And when he gets to Nauvoo, by the 1840s, Joseph Smith has moved into this plural God idea, but even then it grows over the few years there at, at uh, Nauvoo. So the whole thing keeps getting more radical. And then Brigham takes it a step further. He's going to take it to <laughs> that our God is Adam. And so he bumps up this stepladder of gods that whereas uh, you had before Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael in the temple ritual, Brigham's bumping it back so that you have Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael God in creation. And uh, it just makes it all the more confusing. So for 40 years, Brigham Young leads the church teaching that Adam's our father and our God in this step down of the hierarchy of gods. Well, when he dies, they scrap that idea and move back to a little more uh, traditional idea of the father and son. Well, traditional by Mormon standards. Uh, Brigham claimed that Joseph taught him the Adam God, but I see that developing out of a, one of Joseph's revelations where he said that um, uh, Adam is the ancient of days. <clears throat> and referring to Daniel, and uh, Christians always assumed that the Ancient of Days was God. And so to make it Adam would seem to be making deity claim at that point. I don't know if Brigham extrapolated from that revelation uh, that Adam, Michael, uh, was the Ancient of Days, if that led him to Adam God, or not. But he claimed, Joseph Smith taught him that doctrine. Anyways, over Joseph Smith's life and Brigham Young's, we see this evolving doctrine. Uh, and now we see the church trying to reel it back in and make it sound more normative. So this is true of Mormon doctrine in general. It was on this speculative, uh, uh, well, I was going to say rising, but maybe it's uh, diminishing. <laughs> uh, this changing doctrine that got more and more speculative after they had to give up polygamy in 1890, then we see everything starting to um, be muffled as they try to gain acceptance in the world. And so the whole message of Mormonism changes where originally under Brigham Young, it was all about men becoming gods and you had to live polygamy to get there. They can't have polygamy, so then they have to change the whole emphasis. And hence today, the whole emphasis of Mormonism is families that can be forever. That wasn't the em emphasis of the church before 1900. Uh, they didn't push that kind of thing. This is a later development. So in the whole history of Mormonism, there is uh, an evolution of things. Because of that, we have all the breakoff groups of Mormonism. <laughs> uh, for whatever period you want to pick in Mormonism from 1830 to now, you can find every decade probably a different church that holds that particular position. Uh, and, and they just keep proliferating. Uh, today they are. It's, now we have the Denver Snuffer movement going on where he's trying to pull them back to more of a Book of Mormon kind of an idea. But there's, there's been... An, over 100 different breakoff groups of Mormonism. So if the whole point of Mormonism was that Christianity was so, so divided 
that we needed a restoration. The restoration hasn't helped because now we have one to 200 more churches than we had before Joseph Smith came along. So that was my long rambling answer. <laughs> Question. Uh, no, I was just. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, mine's kind of a two phased question. One yeah. uh, has to do with Lucifer in the uh, sense that I don't, I don't really believe that the concept of Lucifer being devil, the devil, uh, originated with Mormonism. Uh, no. No. Venus or something like that, as I recall. Um, but I was wondering if you have a backdrop on that, and also if you wouldn't mind mentioning uh, a little bit more about that third of the host of heaven that followed this word and came uh, to earth, because that's a very interesting thing to shoot. Uh, I haven't done enough research on that to talk off the top of my head. Uh, I don't see it as... Um, relating to anything to do with humans. Uh, all of that relates to fallen being, fallen angels. I, I don't see it as relating to anything with humanity. Oh, I, uh, I was uh, under the impression that uh, the third of the hosts of heaven were um, uh, African people who come to earth and no. developed dark skin. No. 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 In Mormonism, the third that fell became demonic spirits. The two thirds that were left in heaven to come to earth as humans, according to Mormonism, were um, varying degrees of righteousness or standing for God's cause. And because of that, of the two thirds that were left in heaven, according to Mormonism, God sent them to earth under different living conditions according to what they deserved. And so this was the development of the idea of the blacks not holding the priesthood is that there were certain spirits in heaven when they had the big war, the ones, uh, I mean, the, the failures got thrown out. So if you think of the rest of having grades A to D, uh, the A guys got to come out as Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and the B guys came out as Baptists or Methodists, and the C guys came out as Hindus or Chinese or something, and the Ds just barely made it past the cutoff and didn't get thrown out, so God sent them to black bodies. So in Mormonism, the blacks, and their old racial doctrines, the blacks were not considered part of the one-third cast out. They were part of the two-thirds, but they were the bottom rung less than valiant crowd that didn't deserve to get priesthood until everyone else had a shot at it. And that's why the polygamists were so upset when the Mormons gave priesthood to blacks because they said, Brigham Young always said, the priesthood would not be given to blacks till all the white people had a chance first because everyone that was born white obviously was part of the A, B, or C crowd and deserved to get priesthood before the Ds. So now they've given up that except on the racial issue. The Book of Mormon is still a racial book, and they're saddled with that, and I don't know what they're going to do with it, because although they no longer teach that blacks are black because of some sort of disobedience, the Book of Mormon still teaches that Indians, the American Indian, is dark because of disobedience, and the Book of Mormon specifically says their skin color was changed. So it still saddles the Mormons with a certain amount of racism, even though they try to brush it aside. Okay, okay let's see one more question. Um, so I'm wondering if we're still talking about in Mormonism uh, the atonement of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Are, what, um, is the ultimate problem still that in Mormonism that we're sinners? Um, or is there a concise way to uh, we'll be talking about this more next week, but in Mormonism, 
they, they use the word salvation in different ways. And so there is general salvation, which they say when Jesus died on the cross, he procured for us general salvation, meaning general resurrection of everyone. But that doesn't mean that we have eternal life. We just have resurrected uh, bodies, and then where we go in heaven is determined by how we performed. Then they speak of individual salvation, which means how each of us did in our life in living for God. And so uh, individual salvation refers to exaltation, the ability to progress to godhood. So it gets very confusing in talking with Mormons because they redefined the words, and that's why there's a little sheet over there on terminology differences. Mormons interchange the word salvation and don't always tell you which meaning they're using. And so it gets kind of confusing. Um, but generally, Jesus brought resurrection and the possibility of eternal life. But salvation and eternal life are not the same things. So Jesus gave you salvation, resurrection. Now you have the ability to progress to have individual salvation or eternal life through performing all the Mormon rituals, living a good Mormon life with the hope that eventually God will award you with eternal life in the celestial kingdom. But that's separate than Christ's atonement. So in their view of the atonement, they are limiting it. And being saved in Mormonism is not having eternal life. Being saved in Mormonism is being guaranteed resurrection. So they speak of salvation, and then they speak of exaltation, which is different. OK, if you want to ask more questions, you can come up afterwards. <laughs> so you said we'll talk more about that next week. Do you have a topic picked for next week? Uh, it's something to do with eternal progression. I don't remember what it says on the brochure. <laughs> OK. All right. But that's what it's going to be covering, is, is uh, how do we get right with God and get back to his presence?